Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday, December 16th, uh, Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. I will call to order the meeting at 6.30 p.m. The next item is roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. Ms. Stevens, if you will. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the lines for directors. And then uh, just a brief reminder, uh, before you speak, make sure that your microphone icon is green. All right, here we go. Uh, so first is Aaron Brockett. Present. Adam Cushing. Chris Giordanelli. Adam Zarin. <clears throat> Ashley Stolzman. Here. Bill Giff. Yes. Thank you. Bill Van Meter. Present. Thank you. Bob Fletcher. Uh, I do see he is in attendance. Um, oh, Bobby there? Issues. Uh, Buds Parker. <coughs> Parker's here. Thank you. All right. Clint Folsom. Uh, this is Neil Shaw from the Town of Superior. Oh, thank you. Uh, Colleen Whitlow. Trying to... Say hello. Colleen. Uh, David Spellman. Deborah Mulby. Here. Don Konya. David Elin. Billy Stone. Hey, I do see Elise in attendance. I'm here. I just. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, Ava Henry. Ava Odoricio for Ava Henry. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> George Lance. I see that he's in attendance, maybe just having muting issues. George Hill. Jason Gray. Herb Atchison. Here. Thank you, Herb. Uh, Jacob LeBure. Okay, I do see Jacob in attendance. Jim Dale. Here. Oh, thank you, Jacob. Jim Dale. Here. Jim. Jeff Baker. Here. Thank you. Jeremy Fay. Jessica Sandgren. Here. Joan Peck. Here. Josie Cockrell. Here. Julie Duran Mullica. Okay, I do see her in attendance, but maybe she's still repeated. Uh, Karina Elrod. Pamela Grove. Catherine Whitman. Jackie Thomas. The conversion blender. I'm going to use the actual witness. Here. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Larson. The stand mixer. Todd and John, you might get in. Larry Strock. Larry Bidham. Here. Lady Tabo. Here. Linda Montoya. Celeste Arner, Linda Olson, Carol Wink, Lynette Kelsey, here, Margot Ramston, Mike Hillman, Mike Hoffman, here, Nicholas Angelo, Nicholas Williams. Here. Nicole Frank. 
Craig Hurst, Paul Sutton, John Ferre, Rachel Bingley, Ryan Toucher, Randy Wheel. Here. Randy Wheelock. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Angles. Roy Palmer. Gail Christie. Sally Daigle. Here. David Black. Stephanie Walton. Hello. Stephanie Walton's here. Stephanie. Steve Conklin. Here. Sammy Nauer. Here. William Lindstedt. Here. William's here. Thank you. And Wynne Shaw. Here. All right, thank you. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum and I will hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Uh, the next item is approval of the agenda. Uh, the phone lines are open. Is there a motion to approve the agenda out there? So moved. <laughs> Director Atchison has a motion. I'm looking for a second. Second, second. George Lance. Okay, George Lance, uh, I, I heard your name. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we will go to the uh, all those in favor, please signify aye. by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Uh, motion carries. We have an agenda. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item, uh, report of the chair. Uh, the first uh, subsection is remarks from new RTD CEO and general manager, Deborah Johnson. I will turn this over to executive director Rex for a brief introduction and then on to newest <laughs> member of our transportation community. Rex, please. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, on behalf of the board, I know I speak, but we're very excited at the opportunity to have um, the new RTD CEO and general manager, Deborah Johnson, with us tonight, just to give some introductory remarks and introduce herself to, to the greater, greater uh, community. Um, anybody who's had an opportunity to meet her um, in her, well, just over a month that she's been, she's been on the job, she's been, she's been fabulous. She's, uh, she hasn't turned down many, many opportunities yet, which is, which is great. I know she's tremendously busy. Um, <laughs> And you know, as as everybody knows, we've had a wonderful working relationship with RTD through the years, and I know that's only only going to continue with uh, with that Deborah at the helm. So Deborah, um, without further ado, please, um, if you wouldn't mind making a few remarks to the board, that'd be great. Well, thank you very kindly for that warm and welcoming introduction, Doug, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak before the board of directors this evening and introduce myself. As introduced, I'm Deborah Johnson, uh, the newly minted general manager and CEO of the Regional Transportation District. And I want to say it's such an honor to come before you this evening to formally introduce myself and to express to all of you my eagerness and willingness and commitment to work cooperatively and collaboratively with all of you. Recognize the importance of the Denver Regional um, Council of Governments especially as we look at it from the Metropolitan Planning Organization vantage point, as we talk about transportation being a viable economic generator for our region, we need to work collaboratively in reference to connecting people to get where they need to go when they want to get there. So with that as a brief intro, just wanted to talk about me somewhat and let you know what I endeavor to do in conjunction with all of you. Um, having been in this space going on 28 years, I am a staunch a servant leader that believes in public service. And more specifically, I'm committed to transportation, public transportation more specifically, because I believe that is a viable vehicle, pun intended, that it allows us to be unleashed from our limitations and basically be exposed and have access to things that and things and places that may have been out of our reach coming from a vantage point where I grew up on public transportation and it enabled me to basically um, attend, you know, a better school to 
placed me on a better rung on the ladder as it came to me aspiring to do a myriad of different things in reference to my professional development. I look at public transportation as that important aspect to any type of community. I'm a firm believer it is the interwoven fabric of a community. And with me being a person in the people business, I recognize that we have a commitment to move people and adhere to our schedules because that is a commitment that we make saying that we need to get people to where they need to go when they want to get there and recognizing in the advent of this current environment in which we're all living and never thought we would during this you know during our lifetime it's clear to see that as we look to um, move our essential workers and we're utilizing our essential workers in reference to doing that that we've been able to keep this economy afloat getting people to you know their primary care physicians hospitals core jobs and basically necessities so i give those brief remarks just to let you all know that here with me as the new uh, transportation leader at the RTD that I'm going to do everything I can to understand what the transportation needs are collectively. I don't want to be Pollyannish in the sense that I'm going to be the panacea that cures our ailments, but at least I'll come with some band-aids and look to us, you know, uh, bridging some gaps and I plan to engage with all your community. So with that, I will yield the floor back to the chair and thank you for the opportunity to greet you all this evening. And want to say in closing, I appreciate all the hard work that all of you do, being great stewards in helping this region be so vibrant. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, thank you again for your time. Uh, I know I speak on behalf of the entire board. Welcome to, to the Denver transportation community and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, the next subsection is Report on Performance and Engagement Committee. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, we did not have a meeting this month, so there is no report. We will report next month. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Director Flynn. Um, report on Finance and Budget Committee, Director Conklin. Uh, Director Conklin, you appear to be self-muted. If you've been talking, we did there we not. Go. I, I, we, we muted at the wrong time. I apologize. Um, we uh, approved and discussed a resolution authorizing the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with Gutera International Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $350,000 for the term of February 2021 uh, through September of 2022. Uh, and we appreciate Ashley Summers for presenting on that from staff. We also discussed and approved a resolution authorizing the executive director to allocate excess CARES, OAA, and SFSS funds in the amount of $3.3 million to local service providers as recommended by the ACA for the six month period of January 1, 2021 through June 30th of 2021. We thank Sharon Day for a great presentation on that. Sharon also provided a briefing on uh, Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies, DORA funding, and we appreciate her time providing that to us. And that's my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. The next uh, item is report of the Executive Director. Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, few things on the on my agenda here this evening. First, um, you should have received an email and a reminder from Melinda. Uh, I, it has to do with the solicitation for your interest in becoming a board officer. Um, and if you are interested in serving as a board officer, please submit the statement of interest by close of business on December 23rd. Um, we're, we're excited to offer this up. And, and please, if you're so inclined, we'd love to have you for consideration. Just so everybody understands what the what the process is going forward. So the nominating committee, uh, which was seated also last month, has the responsibility of recommending a slate of officers to the board. Um, so they will meet in early uh, early January, um, and then we'll share their recommend recommend a slate of officers as an information item first um, in the January meeting agenda packet, and then that rec recommended slate will be voted on by the board in February. So again, if you're interested in, um, in uh, serving as a board officer, please submit 
the statement of interest by the close of business on December 23rd. And if you have trouble uh, locating one of those emails, please just reach out to myself or Melinda. We'll make sure to get you the get to uh, to get you the, the uh, materials. Um, next item is just a heads up that we anticipate bringing an item to the board in January related to an amendment to the Dr. Cog Articles of Association um, to allow us to change our fiscal year. You'll uh, remember Jenny last month in her uh, 2021 budget item um, mentioned that staff has had conversations with the Finance and Budget Committee about changing our fiscal year from a calendar year, which it currently is, to the state uh, fiscal year beginning on July 1st. It just aligns better with our with our revenue streams, and um, we're uh, we're looking forward to uh, um, you know making that process more efficient for for uh, for budgetary purposes. Um, see here also um we are launching a transportation photo contest now through january 20th we're asking people to submit their best transportation photos to celebrate all the different ways we get around our region um the winning photo uh, may be included in our metro vision regional transportation plan um, our 2050 update that we're, we're currently working on and uh and the grand prize winner will receive a gift basket of colorado items so that's uh it's pretty cool on his face, but um, we're we're excited to offer this opportunity, and hopefully we get a, a lot of a um, lot of uh, pictures that we can we can choose from to include in our 2050 plan. It's easy to submit. Um, you can post the photo on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook using the hashtag Let's Go 2050, or just simply email your photo to photocontest at drcog.org, or obviously just uh, you can you can email that to myself, Melinda, or Quite frankly, anybody on staff. Again, that deadline is January 20th, and we're getting the word out through social media and the like. So um, we should have uh, we should have a lot to choose from. I hope. I also want to give you guys a heads up on a um, on something we've been working on over the over the past couple of weeks. We know that housing and and uh, most notably affordable housing has been a very hot topic, obviously in this region as it has throughout the state. And we're, we're working out some details to offer a four-part webinar workshop series on affordable housing starting in January and running through April. We'll probably do this kind of under, under the umbrella of our uh, idea exchange. Um, the, the topics we're looking at is um, one, financial tools for affordable housing. Um, the second is best practices in permitting processes. Third, um, from a developer's perspective, things they wish communities knew. And last would be tips, best practices, and outside the box solutions. Basically, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a best practices um, workshop from around our region, around the country, well, wherever we can, we, we can get the, uh, the, the, uh, the, those best practices that we'd like to share with you all. So that will there'll be one a month, January through, through April. And um, we'll get more information out to everybody, but we're hoping, um, all, of course, all of our board members will be invited as well as um, staff from our communities and quite frankly, anybody who's interested. We're partnering in this venture with Housing Colorado, Colorado Housing and Finance, and um, the Division of Housing um, through, through, through DOLA. So stay tuned, there'll be more information coming out about, uh, about that. Um, Mr. Chairman, just in closing, I, I would like to take a moment just to thank all the directors for their continued commitment to, to this regional collaborative we call Dr. Cog. Um, we are, we're truly grateful for the time and energy you commit continuing this conversation to ensure that our, rate, our region remains one of the best places to live, work, and play. Um, I would especially like to thank those directors whose time is, um, whose time on Dr. Cog is, is coming to an end. Um, individuals like uh, Director Elise Jones and Director Roger Partridge, um, who've been here, I mean, quite frankly, they're all I've ever known at, uh, when I think of Dr. Cog. They've been here as long as I have, and I'm uh, truly going to miss them. I would also like to thank uh, Director Sabo, Direc Director Strzok, um, for their time on the board, and if there's any others that I miss that I know that are, that are rolling off the board here uh, at the end of the year, um, I apologize, but please know that um, we, as staff, we, 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 we're going to miss you all very dearly, um, but, um, but we wish you nothing but the best in your next chapter. So thank you very, very much for your commitment to, to, this, to this region, to your commu community, and to this state. 
And in closing, sir, um, on behalf of Dr. Cox staff, I also would like to wish everyone a safe and joyous holiday season, and we look forward to seeing you all again in 2021. That's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Next item, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Uh, consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. I am told that we have public comment speakers. Ms. Stevens, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I'm going to open up the phone lines to just make sure that there is no one uh, solely on the phones. Uh, if you are on the phones for public comment, please just heart, hit star six now and it will unmute you and you can speak. Okay, I don't hear anyone on the phones, um, but uh, I do see some hands raised. So our first public comment will be from Julie Hood. Uh, I will just remind you that you have three minutes and at the end of three minutes, I'll ask you to make your closing statement so you can unmute, your, unmute yourself now and speak. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Julie Hood from Strasburg, Colorado. I work with Senior Hub, and thank you guys for all of your grant money that you have spent out here on the rural plains. I am talking today regarding our meal program that I'm advocating for personally for May Farms. What has happened over the last four or five months is overwhelming as what the seniors have received from fresh meals and people coming to the door to welcome them. I have some comments from several of our clients out here that would truly love to continue the partnership with May Farms. I know that through our the grant that's coming up for the meal-based program or restaurant program, they're using a facility in Denver. And I understand that. And the main goal is to make sure all the seniors get food, but I am advocating on my own for our rural town. It's a domino effect out here. When one business shuts down, it just snowballs. So if May Farms isn't able to continue paying their people and helping out the community, it also affects the store where they get all of their um, food, fresh vegetables to prepare these meals. So then the store is also left out and our local store is very small, but it serves Deer Trail, Byers, Strasburg, Bennett. They're the only store out here that delivers. So if they go under, Everybody does. It's the only one that also gives out any kind of pharmacy and will deliver it directly to their doors. So for me, I know that we're moving in another direction with another one, but I would like consideration to relook at May Farms because they are local. We're serving over a hundred people right now with meals. And I had 53 people on a wait list that wanted to get these homemade meals. We deliver three of them a week fresh cooked, they can heat them up when they're ready for them. And the comments coming back, this is Ruth from, she wanted me to read this. She is 82 and her husband's 86. My husband and I live outside Strasburg, Colorado and have generally enjoyed the May Farms meals that we are receiving. We never had any children, so it's only Earl and I at home. Because my husband's health has deteriorated so much over the last few years, he is unable to get around our home without help from day to, to with any of the day-to-day -day chores. He uses a walker to maneuver from room to room, but his legs are un, unable to support standing for more than a few minutes. The May Farm meals has been a lifesaver for me. I've, I'm recovering from knee surgery from earlier in the year, and by the time I tend to Earl's needs all day, I'm exhausted, too exhausted to cook a balanced meal. They just open a can of soup. She's totally overwhelmed. She says, May Farms meals are perfect for Earl and me. I can heat them up in just a few minutes and we have a delicious, healthy meal that we can sit and share together. They look forward to the delivery person because that's the only one that they see on a consistent basis. Um, they said that the portions are perfect. They even sometimes have leftovers for the next day. One of the bright stars for them, neither one of them have left their home since March. We're the only ones that's contacting them. So we see them three times a week, talking to them, making sure, checking in on them. But for her, she said, it's a lifesaver for her that she would not be able to continue cooking and stand there all by herself. There's also another 80, or I'm sorry, 78 year old lady in Strasburg, Bobby, who she pretends that she's at a restaurant 
when she gets these meals. She sets up real china and dishes and pretends like she went out. And she also has not been out of her house since March. So for me, because I grew up out here, if we lose all of our local businesses, our town will shut down. And with COVID, so many has shut down already. They don't have the opportunity for meal delivery from restaurants. There are no restaurants. We have Domino's and Bennett and they won't even deliver to buyers. So May Farms, with what they've done through since June, has been a lifesaver for so many people out here. I know that even though we're going with somebody else, is if there's a possibility down the road to rebid on it, I know that May Farms would be more than willing to rebid the meals for cost effectiveness so that they could continue paying their uh, people uh, and they continue. Sorry, go ahead. Pardon me? I just no, need to make a statement. Oh, in, in ending, I'm just really trying to advocate for our local town. One supports the other. So if there's any way to readdress this down the road so that May Farms can be reconsidered to provide meals out here instead of the meals on wheels that we were getting, I would really appreciate it as the other 72 people that reached out to me to talk to you on this board meeting to let them know. And this is just a small sample of the calls that I have received nonstop from people wanting to make sure it continues with May Farms being local. Thank you very much, Ms. Hood. We will uh, we will forward your, your comments and concerns to uh, our AAA department and um, we appreciate your time and, and interest. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just wanted to comment from myself being a local out here, not necessarily representing Senior Hub at this point, but I'm just the local that I know these people, I grew up with them. So they were Mr. and Mrs. to me. We understand completely. Thank you so much for your time and reaching out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stevens, is there anybody else for public comment? We do have an additional hand raise from uh, Randall Loeb. So Randall, you may go ahead and unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes. Good evening, everyone. And I hope you're all and your families are safe and that you have a hearty, healthy and fulfilling new year. Uh, I'm in uh, Denver. I've been an advocate on homeless issues for a long, long time. And we're having a memorial a lantern one this time on the coldest night, the longest night, I, me I meant to say, um, December 21st, which is a Monday from 5 to 7.30 at the city and county building of Denver. However, it represents those people who have died all around the region throughout Dr. Cog. And uh, I work on the transit side of things. I was really happy to hear Deborah Johnson's voice since I know her. Uh, and I have pushed in the transit in both the Alliance and also in the 2050 vision, we have to have free public transportation, everyone. <laughs> it's not really a question about it. It's really a matter of survival. If you want to spare less miles traveled, vehicle miles traveled, and you want to spare healthier environment you make the way in which you get people from one place to another free and it then spurs your economy it has a direct relationship just like the four-part series you're doing on development of housing uh, which i also applaud greatly it has to be where people really need to have that housing out in places and removes and then they have to have a transit system that allows them to come into the city with ease and therefore not have a vehicle ever. Uh, and being a person who's nearly 70, Dale will empty January 29th, uh, I feel that I would like to leave a legacy in this region where I've been for since 1979 of people basically who are taking care of regardless of whether their demographics are such and such or their race or their place that they have come from or whether they're documented or not i don't really think any of that matters i think actually what matters is whether or not we leave a legacy of caring having a courage to care and as i like to call it revolutionary love uh, so i would hope you would join us on zoom on uh, the 21st to listen to one of my prayers i do them by the way as some of you may know before the senate and the House of Representatives. 
and I'm hoping to do that if we ever meet again. And so I'm, I'm actually also asking that we all get it together to realize we need to care for one another, that the masks, the accommodations to make sure that we are socially distant are essential, not just for me to be safe, but for you to be safe. And that's part of a legacy we should offer. And I know as public servants, you believe this anyway, but I have to utter it because sometimes I think we get mixed up as to what really matters the most. Have a healthy and happy new year. Thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Loeb. Always great to hear your voice. Um, Ms. Stevens, is there anybody else for public comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I am not seeing any other hands raised. All right, thank you so much. We will close public comment at 7.01 p.m. The next section of our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, if someone would desire to pull something off or comment on a matter on the consent agenda, please speak up. Otherwise, I am looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move for approval. Is that Director Atchison? Larry Bittem. I, I, I apologize, Director Bittem. Uh, we have a motion. Bob Pfeiffer, second. Thank you, Director Pfeiffer. We have a second. Um, we will go to the votes. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. The next section of our agenda is the action items. <laughs> Item eight. Uh, fiscal Year 2020 Transportation Improvement Program Project Delay Actions. Mr. Cottrell, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. So the adopted TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases, including how to address these delays if they happen. And regardless of the reason, uh, project implementation delays tie up the limited funding available for Dr. Cog to allocate. So at the end of federal fiscal year 20 in October, Dr. Cog requested CDOT and RTD to review the status of those projects that had FY20 funding, in addition to those projects that were delayed for a first year last year. And after verification, uh, Dr. Cog's staff then contacted the sponsors with the project phases that were not, initiate, not initiated and therefore delayed to find out the reasons for their delay and then also to assist them in developing a plan to initiate those delayed project phases. So the attached report summarizes the project phases that were delayed as of September 30th. Since earlier this year, uh, COVID-19 clearly has played a role in the development of these projects, even if projects were not delayed um, and didn't show up in our report. And over the last few months, TIP project sponsors were allowed to make a request to Dr. Cog staff to consider these COVID-19 impacts to their project delays. Uh, these options included uh, moving the delay deadline out, so essentially resetting this delay to a future date, say October 1st to January 1st. Um, they're also given the option to move funding into a different year, so for example, from FY20 to 21, or even apply to CDOT to use um, state toll credits. These staff recommendations regarding the COVID-19 impacts to delayed projects are included within the report. So overall, the report states that seven project phases were delayed for a second year, with two of these projects already having initiated their phases. At your November board meeting, uh, each project um, asked for a variance in the, in the TIP policy to continue. The remaining five delayed projects were granted a 120-day extension. In addition, uh, four of these projects also requested and were granted another variance due to COVID-19. So in addition to these projects that were delayed for a second year, uh, 32 projects are, were delayed for a first year in which five have already been initiated and therefore are no longer delayed. So a motion this evening to approve staff's recommendations would allow these projects to continue. Um, but just a few observations concerning these delays. Um, the, no, the number of delayed projects is approximately double versus a typical normal year, um, though I think it's important to point out that the first year of any four-year TIP cycle does typically have a higher number of delays versus the other three years in a cycle. And this is mainly due to uh, sponsors uh, beginning the IGA process and being able to get them executed. 
Um, as mentioned earlier, COVID-19 did impact, um, ha had a large impact for the projects this year, and it did impact most of these 32 first-year delayed projects, uh, some even more than others. Approximately half stated that COVID was the main or sole reason for the delay. Um, and I think it's very safe to say that almost all the TIP projects that um, we're working through their FY20 funding um, were impacted by COVID in some way, even though if they weren't delayed and showing up in the report. Um, concerning IGA development and execution, uh, this still seems to be sort of a large impact on delays. Uh, approximately 40% of the delays um, did have some type of delay due to, due to their IGA. Um, and I think this is especially notable since project sponsors have had, um, since, the, the, since the TIP was adopted in August of two, 2019 to execute these IGAs. Um, solely from the staff perspective and observations, um, these delays are coming from both the local sponsors and from the CDOT and or RTD side. Uh, following just a quick note about project staffing and project pre-planning, um, these both continue to occupy reasons for some of these project delays, though I think especially this year, uh, most of these were centered around COVID-19. So with that, I'd be happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Um, I'll note that both the, the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee have recommended this report. Uh, and if you have no questions or comments, the motion before you is to approve the actions proposed by Dr. Cog's staff regarding the TIP project delays for federal fiscal year 20. Thank you very much, Mr. Cottrell. Uh, board members, if you have any questions for Mr. Cottrell on this matter, please raise your virtual hand or press star six if you are on the phone. Uh, Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you for questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just wait a moment to see if any hands go up for questions or comments. Okay, and at this time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Thank you very much. Uh, with no questions or comments on this item, I am happy to entertain a motion. If, uh, if you have a motion, please uh, raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone so Ms. Stevens can talk and call on you. All right, thank you. The first hand to go up was from uh, Director Atchison. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, I move that the board approve the Transportation Improvement Program amended uh, based on the attachment B. Thank you for the motion, Director Atchison. Do we have a second? Second. Tammy Mauer. All right, Director Mauer, thank you very much for the second. <laughs> we'll move to the, the right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item, item nine, corrections to the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, fiscally mm -hmm. constrained project and program investment priorities. Mr. Rieger, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cogstaff. So at your November meeting, you approved what we called the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, uh, fiscally constrained, meaning cost feasible project and program investment priorities. Um, after your November board meeting, I discovered that the project list that we had included in your board packet was a slightly earlier version um, of the list that was actually meant to be the final list. And so the changes from the version that was in your packet to the version that, for example, RTC approved uh, were very minor. We've listed those in the agenda item, the memo uh, for this agenda item. You should see them there on your screen. And these were really about sort of tightening up project descriptions um, and really more sort of administrative, um, uh, administrative changes to this list around uh, these projects. There was nothing substantive here in terms of the nature of these projects or the cost of these projects. However, that said, um, there were changes, obviously, uh, from the list that was in your packet. We wanted to be transparent with you um, in terms of what those changes were. That's why we wanted to bring this back. Um, and given that this is an uh, MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization Transportation Item, um, your action ultimately, the list you approved, needs to identically match uh, the list that the Regional Transportation Committee approved. So we wanted to bring the correct list back to you tonight, um, be transparent about these minor changes, and ask you to reapprove the list of the 2050. And BRTP fiscally constrained project and program uh, investment priorities. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Rieger. Uh, board members, do we have any questions or comments for Mr. Rieger? Uh, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, do we have any questions or comments on this matter? All right, thank you. I'm going through the list to see if there are any hands raised. And I don't see any questions at this time. All right, uh, with no questions or comments, I am happy to entertain a motion on this item. Uh, please raise your virtual hand and press star six. Okay, looks like we have a hand raised from uh, Director Walton. Stephanie Walton, go ahead. Yes, I won. I feel like I'm playing that game show where you press the buzzer and try to beat her. I moved to approve the corrected 2050 MVRTP fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities, recognizing the Metro Vision's plans, primary objectives were considered in developing these recommendations. Uh, congratulations, Director Walton, and uh, thank you for the motion. Uh, do we have thank a second, you. Ms. Stevens? Uh, we do have a second hand raise from uh, Director Wynn Shaw. Wynn, go ahead. I second. All right, thank you, Director Shaw. We have a motion and a second. Uh, going to the vote. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Abstain. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item, item 10, Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvement Program, Safer Main Streets Project Awards. Mr. Papsdorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Papsdorf here, um, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations um, at Dr. Cog. I'm going to take the board on a quick little way, way back machine trip um, back to April 15th of this year when the board adopted the Urban Arterials Multimodal Safety Improvements Program eligibility rules and selection process. Um, that um, has been branded the Safer Main Streets um, program and application uh, process was opened up in July and application period closed about an, on August 14th of this year. Um, just to remind the board, the goals of the Safer Main Streets program uh, really focused on reducing fatal and serious injury crashes on the region's transportation system, supporting uh, transportation system improvements that safely accommodated uh, all modes of travel, um, especially travel by vulnerable populations, um, and um, really making sure that we were um, completing the uh, transportation system through these, this grant program uh, through a really important partnership between Dr. Cog and CDOT program has about $77 million of funding available for the program. Um, the um, recommendation before you tonight is for an initial allocation of funding to projects uh, through that process. TAC recommended approval um, unanimously, as did RTC this week. Uh, with that introduction, I do want to hand off to Paul Gisaitis, um to run through a presentation from uh, CDOT, and if you give me a moment, I'm going to, uh, Jan Rowe from CDOT is going to open a presentation for you, and then um, I'll hand off to Paul Gisaitis, the Region 1 RTD Director. Paul. Yeah, thank you, Ron, and good evening, board. Um, Paul Gisaitis, Region 1 Director for CDOT. Uh, today, we are pleased to give you an update on the status of the Safer Main Streets program. Um, before I start, I want to thank you and your staff in advance for all the participation that you've provided in this process. And our goal tonight is to get approval to uh, go forward with this program through the Dr. Cog board and get these projects on the street as soon as possible, which will also help stimulate the economy in this COVID time. This is an incredibly important program. We've all been talking about Vision Zero a lot. We're all vulnerable users at some point, and the number of serious injuries and fatalities are simply unacceptable. If we're serious about Vision Zero, we need programs like this, and we need to make sure projects selected through this program move the needle on safety. We did learn a lot through this process, and we want to include these lessons learned in future grant opportunities. So our process to date included a project selection panel which then was reviewed by an advisory panel made up of Dr. Cog, RTD, and CDOT uh, people along with representatives from um, the sub-regions. 
And at that point, we brought forward the list to CDOT leadership who felt it was also important to add some stronger analytic calculations to ensure that the best projects moving that needle on safety were selected. So to that end, we asked our traffic and safety team at CDOT to drop what they were doing and do a full benefit cost and level of service of safety analysis, which was a huge undertaking, but brought some very real numbers to the table. The good news was that in most cases, the BC and the loss calculations solidified that we had selected the right projects. And so we ended up selecting 30 projects totaling just under 59 million, which is the list in your packets. Uh, Jan, can you bring it to the next slide? All right, and um, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide because it would take uh, a while here, but we can answer questions later on about any of these. But these, uh, just to remind everybody, this is a list of the program goals that we had for this uh, grant opportunity. And then uh, Jan, can you move to the next slide? And this is just a list of eligible project types. Um, also, uh, you know, we didn't just look at benefit cost and loss, we looked at um, other aspects of what we thought would result in the best possible projects. So with that in mind, I'd like to hand this off to Jordan Rudel of CDOT, and he's gonna run through some schedule issues. Jordan? Yes, thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Jan. Um, uh, good evening. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, board. Um, this here, we've talked a little bit with the fantastic opening remarks from, from both Paul and, and Ron Papsdorf with Dr. Cog. This is just a visual recap here of um, the pathway and the, the major milestones that, that we pursued beginning with the project call being released back on July 9th. And so you can see the pathway uh, had many checkpoints with our selection panel conversations, um, our follow-up with advisory committee, and then back and forth through that, that process again, you know, just to make sure that we were having the appropriate conversations with all the key stakeholders that were part of um, getting us to where we are here today. And so <clears throat> just a, a quick recap, we, we had those um, motions passing to get us um, here to the board meeting on December 16th and we were able to share um, you know the updates and information as well with our CDOT Transportation Commission um, meeting um, earlier today as well and so we're looking forward to to walking through the rest of this here with you this evening. Next slide please Jan. Thought it would be important just because it has been a little while to recap um, you know, from the start here, we were really excited to see the interest um, in applications. We received a total of 46 applications for this this call to uh, to improve safety in the Dr. Cog area. And and of those 46 applications, we received a total of 122 million dollars of requested improvement need. Um, what we thought would be helpful just to provide here is that approximately half of of these applications, the 46 applications. We're proposing work on state highways and um, you know, right around half or a little over half had some nexus or proximity to transit, which was another big focus that we looked at in this call. So looking <clears throat> at, at the big picture here, realizing the Dr. Cog area um, includes both region one and region four within CDOT, we thought we'd provide a little data here just to show some analysis between how much money was requested in region one and region four and the dollars and cents um, adjacent or or along transit and on state highways and in that right column there you'll see um, we also included what the total dollar amounts for those projects would equate to with match uh, a lot of interest a lot of need and a lot of excitement on our end as we were sorting through those applications next slide please Jan. of the 46 applications we received um, it was fantastic. You can see the, the number here. We just wanted to show graphically um, each jurisdiction, how many applications per um, per county. In most cases here, we, we received a lot of interest, a um, lot of project needs. And um, unfortunately, we can't you know fund them all um, under this particular call, which we'll talk about here a little bit more as we get to the project selection uh, proposal for tonight. 
but um, this was a nice summary showing showing numbers of applications in each jurisdiction. Next slide, please. And um, you know, of of the 46 projects, we come here before you tonight with with 30 really really great projects um, that are being recommended that span across 19 jurisdictions. That was um, really you know what we were looking for here is is 83 percent of the the applications um, and the projects that we're looking at here for these 30 are near or adjacent to transit, which is a pretty high high mark and, and something that, um, you know, really, really we felt like um, is, is what we were looking for here. 65% uh, of the applications we received, um, uh, excuse me, not received, um, but that are recommended for these 30 are along highways. And um, with the total project match, we we move up to around 83 million dollars is what would be invested in this program getting projects out the door uh, next slide please and i'll turn things over here to our deputy director of program delivery jessica micklebust good evening everybody um so what we've got on the screen now are the 30 projects being recommended for funding um, I recognize some of this font might be a little bit small. So this is in your packet, I believe on page um, 108 with a, with a full list as well. Um, so the 30 projects that are recommended were, were brought before the panel and received a lot of scrutiny and a lot of evaluation. These projects really um, show an evident effectiveness for safety, multimodal and expanding access for all the residents in the Denver metro area. I can say as a panel member that we spent hours deliberating and, and pouring through the applications and looking at the data that was provided from each of the applicants to really make sure that we took um, full consideration of all the criteria, but really selected those projects that were going to move the needle on safety. Um, as you can see, there are a variety of projects. Um, we're, we're proud to say that projects in every jurisdiction that applied are being recommended for funding. Um, there are projects that are larger and smaller in scale. And, and as a panel, we really took a look um, both in the existing conditions of the project area, what's happening today, what conditions are we observing today, as well as the future. What are we seeing potentially occurring in the future with um, development or with transit or with changing conditions? Um, as we know, areas don't stay the same. They, they continually ebb and flow. So I want to talk through um, four projects just to kind of give a flavor for the lens that we were looking through as a panel and how, how some of these projects just are really different from each other. The first one I'm going to highlight is an application that came in from Lakewood. They are um, our highest recipient at $10 million, the West Colfax Pedestrian Safety and Infrastructure Project. This is a project where there have been 806 crashes in the last five years. 93 of those were bike and pedestrian collisions with several fatalities. Um, as Paul mentioned, our um, traffic team took a really hard look um, at the safety measures we were looking at with these applications. Um, this project had a benefit cost ratio of 2.91, so definitely on the higher side. And um, overwhelmingly, the panel just recognized the high need for those vulnerable users along the West Colfax corridor. Um, another project, very different than the Lakewood project, um, in Commerce City, the Colorado Boulevard bicycle and pedestrian improvements between 68th and 70th. This is a project that's near the new RTV um, N line, the 72nd station. And interestingly, there is no uh, benefit cost ratio right now. That it, it sits at a zero. But when the panel took a look at the applications and a look at all of the data and the surrounding area and the potential for transit access to that part of our um, of town, we really felt like this project really could shift and make a really big um, movement with safety by providing sidewalks and access to that station. Uh, another project very different in scope, size, and scale is in Region 4, CDOT Region 4 in Nederland. Um, this was a crosswalk improvement project and it had a lower BC of 0 0.20. Um, and so as we were looking at it as a panel, we took a look at 
you know, what, what the city, what the Netherlands was trying to accomplish. And really there's an affordable housing unit. And by providing these crosswalk improvements, we were really improving access for the residents in that area. Um, and finally, kind of a last project with a different uh, flavor, the um, 30th Street in Boulder. This is a separated bike lanes along State Highway 70 um, or Apaho Road. And um, benefit cost ratio of, of 0 0.10 has a lower crash history, but the value um, actually, as we looked at the project overall, was very high. You've got um, a CU buffs are adjacent to that area. Boulder is very well known for its avid bicycling community. So really high potential to continue to encourage um, other ways to move around town with that project. That project was recommended for a partial award. So there were several projects in municipalities that were recommended for a partial award. And really the reasoning behind that was, um, you know, the project had great validity. Um, maybe there were some components of the project that just didn't quite fit in with the Safer Main Streets application process, but we wanted to award them something to keep, um, you know, the components in that were really moving the needle on safety at the table. So that's an example of a project that was a partial award. Um, their application indicated it was a scalable project of scope and size. So um, this list is in your packet. And as you can see, we're recommending an award amount of about $58.8 million. Next slide. This is another tool that we used. Um, I think Jan's going to click in here. There's a map. Um, this is a Google Earth map platform. CDOT has been using this recently to really convey information geographically. We can show a lot of detail through these mapping mechanisms. Um, feel free after this session to, to click on the link and you can navigate around. You can hover over the dots and see information about each of the recommended projects. Um, so those projects in green are ones that are recommended. But right now, Jan's hovering over the Netherland Crosswalk Improvements. So you can actually see, you know, the detail of that project, the funding that they requested, and obviously the location. So this was a really powerful tool as we started to really look at the high injury network, and we were looking at the um, the injury corridors to see where where are the projects lying? Are we are we really hitting the mark? Are we getting them in the corridors where we're really seeing higher crash data and higher pedestrian um, and bicycle fatalities and, and crashes? So this was a really powerful tool when the panel was looking also at geographic proximity of the projects. Are we covering you know a wide range of the Dr. Cog region? Are we are we spreading out the funds as much as we can while still kind of hitting the objective of the safer Main Street call? Next slide. All right, so what happens next? Uh, tonight we are recommending um, and hoping to receive a first set of awarded projects, the list of 30. And then we do have some residual um, funding from that first round. And what we've coined the second um, kind of phase of Safer Main Streets is Project Solicitation 1.5. The remaining about $18 million is really being reserved for those entities that already applied in the first phase of Safer Main Streets. We're asking them to um, bring forward, we'll have individual discussions with them on, you know, maybe where their application fell short or maybe where some additional data was needed that we didn't receive in the application. Um, you know, the panel was reviewed 46 applications and um, there was a lot of tremendous data and, and some of them we think we could we could get there if we just knew a little bit more about the project or could spend some time with the applicant. So in solicitation 1.5, those um, applicants that were either unsuccessful or partially funded will have the opportunity to provide an updated application for reconsideration for those funds. CDOT, um, along with Dr. Cog, have already established some meeting time frames with those um, applicants in January in 2021 to sit down and talk through their projects and look at that and uh, look at potential for funding. Um, for those projects that were successful, um, that are being recommended for funding, those uh, success letters will be going out hopefully late this week, which would be tomorrow or Friday or next week. 
and um, entities will be getting a number. There's three different letters. You will either have a success, you were awarded letter, um, as a partial award letter, or a regret letter. Um, some agencies that submitted more than one project may have a combination of one of those letters. Um, we've heard our partners loud and clear, and it was mentioned earlier in the Dr. Cog update, um, the IGA and contracting process can be a little bit rigorous and quite time consuming. So in the spirit of getting these projects out on the street as fast as possible and stimulating the economy with this first round of 30 projects, we are taking a hard look internally at CDOT at what we can do to streamline or really enhance our IGA process. Um, we've already got a team of folks in Region 1 that are at the ready uh, once those IGAs start rolling in, and we're also looking at some other opportunities to really make sure that we can address your concerns to get these projects out um, as fast as possible. Um, and so with that, we look forward to uh, the first phase of projects and look forward to discussions on the solicitation 1.5. And with that, I believe we'll be taking questions. Thank you very much. Uh, board members, do we have any questions or comments on this item? Please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you for questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, it looks like our first question or comment is from Director Bill Gitt. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody that's part of this program. Um, we uh, in Erie are lucky enough to be on this list to get an award. And uh, again, um, our staff uh, evaluating this process and the equity within it and just the overall need for, for this program has been a really a godsend for us. And we just wanted to thank everybody for all the hard work you've done for this. And uh, we're very excited to look forward to these programs in action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director right, Gitt. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Stevens. I, I will turn it to you. My apologies. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, and actually, at this time, I, I do not see any other hands raised. All right, with no additional questions or comments, the only uh, remarks that the, the chair can provide is uh, uh, a, a comment I provided at RTC. Um, as I review the list of projects, it's, it's uh, very pleasant to see some of the more non-traditional names. Uh, we occasionally see some of the uh, some names uh, from communities over and over again. And again, that, that is fantastic. But to see names that that um, such as Erie, Superior, and Morrison to the list it just um, really um, satisfies me and uh, truly appreciate the uh, the funding that goes to those communities as well as any community who who has a need, which we all do. But with no further questions or comments, uh, I am willing to entertain a motion. Um, if there is a motion, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, do we have anyone, please? Uh, the first hand I saw go up was from Director Aaron Brockett. Director Brockett, go ahead. Hi there. Um, well, I think this is an absolutely fantastic uh, program. So I am very happy to move that we award fifty-eight million eight hundred fifty-three thousand four hundred and thirty dollars to the proposed list of safer Main Streets projects as presented. Thank you, Director Brockett. Ms. Stevens, do we have a second? Uh, the second hand I saw go up was uh, Director Elise Jones. Director Jones. And I would agree with Director Brockett and a happily second. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, with a motion and a second, uh, we move to the voting portion of this item. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you all. Uh, the next item or the next section of the agenda, informational briefing. Item 11, preview of 2021 state and legislative session. Mr. Morrow, if you would. Make sure I remember the unmute. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and uh, directors. Um, I'm here to uh, give you a brief overview of the upcoming legislative session. I also have, uh, I believe, on 
line, uh, Dr. Cog's lobbyists, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle, which I'll uh, turn over to in a second. So I think you all know that um, the General Assembly is scheduled to convene this coming January 13th. Um, and uh, what we're gonna do here is just give you a brief overview of what to expect. Um, and this will include implications of the uh, November election, uh, some bu budgetary issues we're following, and particularly uh, related to Dr. Cog's main focus areas of transportation and aging. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to see if I can turn it over to Ed and Jen to give you a little bit of that overview coming out of the uh, election and uh, leading into the session. So we'll see if Thank they you, are available. Hopefully you can hear me. This is Jen Castle. Am I good? Oh, okay. I can hear Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Thank you, everyone. I am Jennifer Castle, and along with Ed Bowditch, we are your lobbying team on behalf of Dr. Cog. Thank you very much for the opportunity to represent you down at the Capitol. We are certainly looking forward to continuing working with you in the 2021 session. As Rich just mentioned, we're going to go over a couple of items and some, some key things that we wanted to highlight that will help put some things into context for the 2021 session. Um, specifically, want to highlight some of the election results from 2020. Um, you know, voters must have been in a good mood, th mood this year as they passed nine of the 11 ballot initiatives that were presented to them. So the ones that are going to have some fiscal implications um, and especially that are go that's going to affect some of the state budget moving forward, we wanted to mention um, some of you may be familiar with some of these, some of you may not. So first and foremost was the approval of Amendment B, which was the Gallagher repeal. This repealed the 45-55 ratio for um, assessing property values in the state. Um, that was repealed. It is going to freeze um, assessment rates as they are currently. Another important ballot measure that passed was a decrease in the state income tax rate. So currently we pay 4.63%. That is going to decrease to 4.55%. That will have about a total of um, 200 million or so for this fiscal year to the state budget. Voters also increase the nicotine tax. That is going to increase taxes on cigarettes and tobacco products and then create a new tax on vaping products. That will have probably roughly the same impact of about 200 million or so um, for this coming fiscal year as an increase to the state budget. And then the last one we wanted to mention was uh, Proposition 118. That was the paid family and medical leave program that passed. And by, by the time CDLE implements this program, it is going, it will be come into effect in 2023. Um, and it's estimated to be a, be roughly a, a billion dollar program that the state is going to start implementing come 2024. Um, so again, a lot, a lot of implications for these, these four measures that pass at the ballot. It's a combination of an increase of state, uh, state revenue increases and state revenue decreases. And Ed, Ed will mention a little bit more um, with with the budget as as when he gives his update moving forward into the 2021 session. The other thing of note that I wanted to mention as it related to the state level elections at the state house, the Democrats were able to pick up one seat in the state Senate. So they will now control the state Senate 20 to 15. The majority over in the House remains in Democrat control as well, 41-24. Uh, Will be, um, will be the majority over in the House. Though I will note two seats did flip um, result, that resulted from um, two incumbents losing, one who was a Republican and one who was a Democrat. So we will still see what is known as the trifecta next year with Governor Polis um, in, the, in the governor's office being a Democrat and then both chambers of the legislature being mm -hmm. under Democratic control as well. And that is certainly going to set up some of the legislation that we will see in 2021. And with that, with that, I will hand it over to Ed. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. This is Ed Bowditch. 
Um, the legislature had a brief three-day special session in late November, early December. Um, it was all focused on COVID relief, trying to get um, relief out to the child care sector, food pantries, um, some sales tax issues for businesses, um, and housing and utility payment assistance. Um, but it was a brief three-day session. They passed 10 bills. Almost all of them had overwhelming um, bipartisan support. Um, in addition to that, as we look towards the 2021 session, um, there'll be a lot of focus on the budget, ongoing budget challenges of the state, uh, some potential tax policy changes. The legislature cannot raise taxes per Tabor, but they can eliminate tax credits and tax deductions and they may make some of those types of changes. They'll also look at transportation funding, and we will talk about that a little more in a minute, um, as well as certain environmental issues. Um, in terms of looking ahead, we've got a couple of key dates. One of them is coming up this Friday. We're gonna get the next quarterly revenue estimates from both the legislative economists and the governor's office economists. The, the revenue estimates we got last quarter at the end of September were very positive. Things really had bounced back, but I think a lot of people are thinking that, that um, the economy has slowed down a lot since then. Jennifer and I will send a report to Rich that he can then distribute after we get Friday's um, estimate. As Rich noted, the session starts on January 13th. We don't know. We know they'll meet on January 13th and swear in the new members but we don't know if they will stay in at that point or go on some sort of extended um, break while the public health situation um, potentially improves. Um, and then if they stay in the full 120 days from the start, they would adjourn on May 12th, but we don't think that's very likely. Um, it's likely they will take a break. With that, I will turn it back to Rich to talk about state funding for senior services. All right. Uh, thank you, Ed. Appreciate that. Um, so I will try to be brief about this because as I think uh, Ed and Jen and I, Doug and Jayla know, I could talk about this aging funding issue for <laughs> a long time. Um, but I think what I'll do is, is really get to the bottom line of uh, uh, some concerns that we have about what's happening uh, with the, the funding for the area agencies on aging, and it's, it's reflected in a line item in the state budget called State Funding for Senior Services. Um, the bottom line is that for two years now, uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget, which is the current year and that was approved last spring, and the fiscal year 21-22 budget uh, that the governor submitted in November, uh, both those budgets jump through a lot of hoops to create what they refer to as general fund savings, um, while at the same time, thankfully, keeping the AAAs flat funded from year to year. The problem that we're, we're, we're seeing is that in, in, the, in this process, um, our general fund appropriation has been reduced by about half uh, from where it was um, uh, two years ago, from about $15 million of general fund to, to under $8 million of general fund. Uh, and, and this is going to be a challenge to, to find the general fund monies to return that appro appropriation back to the pre-pandemic levels um, in, the, in the following budget, the, the fiscal year 22-23 budget, as revenues may not recover by then. Uh, so that's that's kind of the first issue that uh, we've been concerned about, and we, we've been having conversations uh, with folks um, at the JBC and in the administration about that. Um, also, um, some of you may recall that uh, we've uh, been the beneficiaries of some uh, uh, fairly significant uh, cash fund transfers uh, over the last two years. Um, in, in, that have been transferred to the older Coloradans cash fund, um, $31 million worth of money that uh, we'd been working with our partners at the state to uh, uh, develop a plan to invest those in the Area Agency on Aging statewide network. Um, because of the 
uh, budget problems and the desire or need for um, the governor and OSPB again to to uh, find general fund, um, we have we are, we basically have lost and and will have lost 25 million dollars out of those 31 million dollars. So basically, the triple A's are looking as at this point that. Um, we will only be able to have spent six million dollars of that money. Uh, so this is also puts us uh, kind of behind the eight ball or behind times in terms of the the work that that we've been doing and have uh, have, have wanted to do um, to uh, strengthen uh, AAA's. Uh, obviously, Dr. Cog, but but the rest of the AAA's around the state too. Um, we will be working with the the administration and the JBC. Um, to attempt to address these issues uh, this year and in subsequent years and to develop a plan uh, over the next few years to stabilize um, future AAA funding. Um, so that's a short version of that issue. Um, more to come on that. Um, I'll brief, briefly tee up the uh, transportation issue. Again, I imagine that, that many of, many of uh, you directors have uh, been hearing a lot about this for a while um, and that and hearing that they're encouraging signs there could be some action next year to increase funding for transportation um, your your dr. Cog staff and lobbyists have, have had a, actually a brief meeting with Senator winter and representative gray about this um, they expect expressed optimism uh, that something will pass this year um, they weren't overly specific except to say that they're considering various fees and that they want a significant portion of the revenues to go to multimodal options with uh, with local flexibility. Um, they also said that they are they're still interested in reintroducing the regional funding bill that they had introduced last session. Um, so we'll see where that goes. And um, with that, I will stop and see if there are any questions or if Executive Director Rex has any further comments. Executive Director Rex, any comments? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, no, I thought Rich did a, a fine job as well as Ed and Jen, of course, of uh, providing kind of a primer to this uh, upcoming legislative session. I hope everybody's getting a good picture of Rich there right now because uh, that's the best he's going to look. On, uh, he's, that's the best he's going to look for six months until the session is over. So hey, this is the first time I've had uh, a button-down shirt and a jacket on since March. Well, you're better than me, my friend. Um, <laughs> The other thing I just might point out real quick, first of all, listen, I, I, know, I hope everybody understands how fortunate we are to have the representation that we do have at the state capitol. Um, Rich, of course, does a, just an unbelievable job and we're so proud of the work that he does. And our, our lobbyists, um, Ed Bowditch and Jen Castle, are, are fabulous, very responsive, and we thank them so very, very much for their work. Um, Rich, the only thing that I might mention that that I don't believe you mentioned was that um, in your packet, there's a link to a report. So part of the conversation that Rich has been having, Rich spearheaded a working group of stakeholders um, in the, you know, kind of the older adults world. Um, and there were some legislators that participated in that, as well as JBC staff and others, um, to kind of begin to explore options for um, more sustainable funding. Um, and I think it was well received. The report itself kind of highlights um, various options that are available to us, and we'll be exploring those with the uh, with JVC and and the the legislature over the, over the next coming months. So just that's just for for your information that's in the packet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, board members, if there's any questions or comments on this item, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you for questions or comments. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> the first hand that went up was from uh, Director Lynette Kelsey. So, Director Kelsey, go ahead. Um, sorry, I was actually, I didn't really click the, the hand raised. I was actually trying to unmute for the past couple of votes and couldn't, so I don't know how the hand raise got raised. Oh, my apologies. We'll make sure that you're unmuted. Um, 
Okay, then our first question or comment is from Director uh, Herb Atchison. Director Atchison. Hey, Rich, I understand that Matt Gray will not be the chair of the House Transportation. Do you know who that's going to be now? Uh, yes, it's going to be Representative Tony Exum, who uh, represents a district in the Colorado Springs area. Is that going to be? Have, I have no further information as to how or why that came about. <laughs> in your opinion, is that going to make much difference for us here in the metro area? You know, I really. I, I really don't have an opinion on that right now. I'm not, I mean, I've not known Representative Exum to have extensive interest over the years in in transportation. Um, but I will say that that I've worked with him uh, a couple of different times uh, uh, on some legislation and have found him very, very good to work with. And so I'm at least happy that that I have a good relationship with him. All right, thanks. And I don't know if Ed or Jen have a comment uh, as well, if they're available. Thanks, Rich. This is Jen. I just might add, uh, Director Atchison, that I don't think that Representative Gray not being the chair of Transportation Committee will preclude him from being very active on transportation issues. He has expressed to us that he is still going to take a leadership role in all things transportation related, whether that's transportation funding, um, RTD. Um, anything like that, I do think he is still going to be um, be considered a leader on transportation in the House. All right. Thanks, Jim. Yep. All right. Thank you, Director Atchison. And with that, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to our chair. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mora, Mr. Bodich, and Ms. Castle. We appreciate your efforts. The next item is... Item 12, setting the 2021 safety targets as required by Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act and setting Vision Zero safety targets. Mr. Rieger, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening again, everyone. Give me just a second to get this set up. Okay, are folks seeing my presentation in presentation mode? We are. Okay, great. So thank you again. I um, wanted to frankly continue our conversation on safety that uh, we started earlier this evening with the Safer Main Streets program. Uh, here we go. Um, so I'm going to start with a conversation um, that some of you may remember, and for some it may be new. Um, we have several federal requirements under the FAST Act, which is our current federal uh, Surface Transportation Act, regarding a performance-based planning system. And you see kind of the five big pillars of um, those performance management requirements on the screen. Um, you actually dealt with a couple of these in your consent agenda. And tonight we're gonna focus on what we call PM1 uh, performance measures relating to uh, safety uh, performance. So just real quick, I'm not gonna read everything on this slide, um, but I do wanna focus on a couple of things. Um, we have five um, sort of measures for which we are required to set targets each year in the safety realm. Um, those are under the performance measures, the third bullet here on the screen. So these are um, numbers and rates of both fatalities, serious injuries, and then a combination of non-motorized uh, fatalities and serious injuries. We calculate these and we're required to do it this way. It's very prescriptive in the federal uh, language. We calculate them based on a five-year rolling average of five individual consecutive points of data. And I know that sounds confusing, so I'll show you that um, in just a moment. And then I would also note the federal guidance here at the bottom of the of the screen, targets should be realistic and achievable, not aspirational. That is the federal guidance. As you'll see in a few slides, we uh, frankly have deviated from that uh, just a little bit over the years. Because we want to be, frankly, we want to be more ambitious in the safety work uh, that we do here. Um, this is a map of our region, obviously, in the area in green um, is our MPO, our Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, Transportation Area. This is the area in which the safety targets apply. Um, the areas in blue um, are areas which are covered by CDOT. Um, both Dr. Cog and CDOT, as well as our MPO partners around the state, um, set safety targets. So let me show you an example of how this works. This is a chart that shows we've been doing this for two years. This will be the third year um, in which we will we were setting annual safety targets. So for each of these three sets of tables, you see the targets that were set. So for example, 2018, 
Again, it's that rolling five-year average, uh, looking in this case from 2014 to 2018. So the numbers that you see on the screen are rolling five-year average numbers, if that makes sense. These are not uh, specific annual numbers. These are incorporating the five-year rolling average. So you see the target that we set, for example, in 2018 and 2019 and 2020. Then you see the actuals of how we performed. Um, and then we're showing you, you know, how are we doing um, so far on this exercise? And as you see, we are either achieving the targets that have been set um, or we're coming mostly pretty close uh, to, to achieving those targets. Um, I know someone will ask about 2020, how are we doing for 2020? Obviously, we won't know for sure for just a little bit, but based on the trend we've seen so far this year, it's going to be close. Um, honestly, we have not seen um, this year much, frankly, of a decrease in, um, uh, in fatalities uh, because of COVID, even though we think people are driving less and obviously our, all of our lives have changed, um, we are still seeing a disturbing number of fatalities um, within our region. The other thing I'd point out here on these five-year rolling averages is that, again, this is the pre prescribed federal methodology. So when you look at each of these, again, let's go back to 2018, for example, um, you know, that was the period of 2014 to 2018. Our ability to affect change in an annual target is, is really low in the sense that of that five-year rolling average, three or four of those years are already sort of completed or already spoken for. Really, it's sort of the current year that's maybe up for debate just a little bit. Um, and so you'll see in a moment how we've tried to kind of deal with that um, in the way that we've approached this work here at Dr. Cog. Um, but that's why the federal guidance of being very short-term, uh, very realistic in these, because it's really hard to move the needle under this prescribed uh, methodology. So what are we doing about safety? Well, we had a long conversation this evening about uh, the Safer Main Streets program um, and hopefully the very beneficial impact of the projects uh, that will be funded in that program. Um, I won't read all of this to you, but just to give you the flavor, obviously in our transportation improvement program, we've got a lot of projects that are directly oriented towards safety. Um, you may recall that uh, just a few months ago, um, you all adopted the Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero. Uh, we have been working since that time to start implementing that plan, um, and I will come back to that in a slide or two. We're currently working on a Complete Streets Toolkit, um, which, is, um, which is to provide yet more tools and information, education, and guidance um, around street design and street safety. Um, and then in the project list for the 2050 plan that I asked you to reapprove earlier in this meeting, um, there's a lot of safety projects in that list, and there's also a programmatic element um, dedicated towards the emphasis of safety. So we're doing much more than this, but I at least wanted to highlight um, these things of, of the importance of safety uh, to all of us here at Dr. Cog. So when it comes to setting these federally required and federally prescribed safety targets, the method that we have used the first two years that we've done this, um, the first two reporting periods, is to base those targets on our Metro Vision plan um, and its current 2040 traffic fatalities performance target, which as you see on the left is fewer than 100 traffic fatalities annually. Basically what we've said is that, you know, that's the target that you all unanimously approved in the Metro Vision plan. What would it take to get there on an annualized basis between now and 2040? Uh, we've done that sort of trend line analysis and then we've used um, that work, that methodology to set uh, the fatalities target. Uh, serious injury targets we've based on a what we call hold the line method could we at least hold the line on serious injuries as our region continues to grow and then um, non-motorized um, fatalities and serious injuries have basically been a combination of those two methods going forward what we're proposing is that the target should be based on the principles outlined in our adopted taking action on regional vision zero this goes back to a promise that we made to this board and that we made to this region uh, this summer when we adopted the plan that said we are absolutely committed to a target of zero. Um, the question is, when do we set, uh, what time frame, which do we set that target of zero? Um, and that's part of the conversation that we want to start having tonight. So just want to show you a little bit of data to help inform that conversation. Um, this is a trend line of um, data plot of our fatalities in this region over the past several years. So these are actual numbers by year. And then we took a look at, um, and I'll show you all three of these here. Um, again, when we sort of look to the future and we kind of think about, well, if we want to get to zero on one of these years, what would it take in terms of an annual uh, reduction to get there? Um, so obviously, if we were as aggressive as 2030, that's the most impactful. We need to average a reduction of 25 fatalities annually um, every year between now and 2030 to get to zero by 2030. Um, and obviously the other end of that bracket is 2040. That would require a reduction of about 13 fatalities annually uh, between now and 2040 to do that. 
So this is for fatalities. And then we did the same exercise for serious injuries. And I'll show you those, those data points. Um, again, same idea here based on the trend line over the last, uh, the actual data plots, I should say, over the last several years of our, of our um, pattern on serious injuries in this region. And again, looking towards the period of 2030 to 2040, what would it take to get to zero uh, when it comes to serious injuries? And then for the non-motorized, remember this is a combination of both fatalities and serious injuries for uh, non-motorized to so walking, uh, bicycling type activities. Um, again, I'll show you those three trend lines between 2030 and 2040 of what it would take to get to zero um, in this category as well. So just to kind of summarize that, some people like graphs, some people like tables. Um, this is the same data I just showed you um, in the last few slides, but synthesized by category, by year time frame to show what it would take to get to zero um, on an annual reduction uh, for each of these fatalities, serious injuries, um, and non-motorized uh, serious injuries and fatalities between 2030 and 2040. Um, from here, I'm going to attempt to go to a quick Mentimeter exercise. So um, I think most of you have done this before. If you go to menti.com, as you see in the top of the screen, you can do this on your smartphone or open up another um, browser window um, on your screen. Again, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Use the code that you see here, which is 2425978. And I'll repeat that again, 2425978. The first question that we have for you is, um, what do you think the target year, what would your guidance to us be in terms of uh, what should the target year be for zero fatalities between 2030 and 2040? So while this is an informational item, we, we're actually sort of, you know, directly asking for your guidance here. So I will give this a moment to, um, to populate. And again, one more time, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and the code is 2425978. So we're at 22 uh, votes of our board members. I'll hold this open for just a moment longer. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to vote and hopefully everyone can see the results on the screen. Um, thank you for this. This is really, really helpful guidance. Um, two more quick questions for you on the mentee exercise. So we just talked about fatalities. Um, what about um, achieving zero serious injuries? So your choices here is the same year um, as zero fatalities within five years after zero fatalities is achieved. And then I think the third one, I lost it on the menu, I think is within 10 years. Um, again, menti.com, um, it's the same code, 2425978. Now hold this open just a second longer. Okay, looks like we've got the board member votes we're going to get. And then one more question for you here. Um, has your jurisdiction completed a safety plan or adopted uh, Vision Zero policies? So this is a yes, no, or not yet, but planning to in the future uh, choices for this one. Again, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and same code 2425978. Okay, I'll hold this open for one more moment. Okay, 
but certainly pleased to see that a majority either have adopted um, a safety plan or a Vision Zero plan or are intending to do so. Okay, and then this is the last slide. Just wanted to kind of uh, reconnect these things back together in terms of a time frame and schedule. So yes, we're talking about two things this evening. We're talking about uh, both the very short term, the 2021 federally required uh, safety targets under the FAST Act, um, but anchored in the larger conversation of uh, the promise that we made to the board and to the region around um, you know, setting that time frame target for uh, to achieve zero uh, when it comes to regional vision zero. Um, work that you will see as part of our 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan um, this coming spring as part of plan adoption. Um, this matters to us because in terms of setting um, the short-term target, the 2021 target, we do have a federal deadline. Um, you see the schedule here that we're, we will intend to take this to um, our Transportation Advisory Committee in January, RTC and the board in February. Uh, we have the federal deadline of February 27th to set um, that 2021 uh, safety target under the FAST Act. So with that, um, that should be it. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Rieger, for your presentation. Um, board members, if you have any questions or comments on this item, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six if you're on the phone. Ms. Stevens, uh, I will turn it over to you for questions and comments. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just give it a moment to see if there are any hands that are raised. All right, at this time, I am not seeing any hands raised for questions or comments. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Mr. Rieger, thank you very much for your presentation and efforts. Thank you. Uh, the next item, item 13, setting congestion management process and preliminary results of the 2019 annual report. Mr. Spots, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just get my screen set up here. One second, please. My presenting window or just my window here? <laughs> I think you're seeing my window. We're enjoying reading oh. your email. Yeah. There we are. That looks better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, we're here to do our report, our annual report on traffic congestion in the Denver region. This is for 2019, which seems like a really, 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 really long time ago now, um, but it is an important report we do every year. Um, and there is some interesting data that happened in there. We will also get to some um, some data that happened about 2020, so that, that may be more interesting to you right now. Um, so typical VMT trends, and like I said, we'll get to some COVID, uh, the effects of COVID on travel in our region. Um, so just a reminder, we do this report every year. Uh, MPOs are federally required to monitor congestion. Um, so this, this report, unlike others, focuses on roadways a lot, specifically in, in congestion, um, the cost of congestion, where rare congestion is, and the severity of that congestion. We've been doing these reports since 2006. Um, and maintain a database with a lot of transportation data. This gives us kind of a long history and a log to continue kind of monitoring how um, the roadway congestion is, is, is um, being mitigated or getting worse or getting better in the region. Just a reminder, there's a lot of travel in this region. There's a lot of people that create this travel. So about 84 million vehicle miles traveled every day. When you think about it, it's, it's a crazy amount of travel. It's like traveling to the sun every day and on every weekday in the Denver region. That's 110 million daily person miles because these vehicles on average carry more than one person. They, there's carpoolers and buses that are still are operating the same roads as the single occupancy vehicles. Um, 15 million individual trips, 13 million of those um, were in cars and trucks. So the primary mode of transportation in this region is cars and or vehicles. Right? But the big kind of headline here, then, you know, if we can rewind and think about how big news this may have been before COVID, is that we did not see an increase in vehicle miles traveled on average between 2018 and 2019. We were estimating a 0% increase in average daily VMT 
So this is before COVID came to the United States anyway, in any significant way. Um, it's a really significant and inter interesting finding. All of our sources we, we referenced to come up with that agreed that there was not any growth in VMT. That's despite population growing. Population growing is our primary driver of additional uh, vehicle miles traveled in this region. So that's good news. Um, you know, it, it speaks to some changing things that may be happening with the economy, with working from home kind of be becoming a, more of a trend before COVID even happened. Um, you can see um, there's kind of a history there of kind of rapid growth uh, as we came out of the recession, of the 2008 recession. And then it's kind of slowed down a little bit the last couple of years. And this year, 2018 and 2019, we we're estimating zero growth. Uh, correspondingly, as population went up, the MT per capita went down. That's one of our MetroVision goals. We are shooting to get all the way down to 2023 20, VMT per capita based on our current numbers. So still a long way to go there to get to our target, but trending in the right direction. Uh, despite that success story, we are obviously, there are many ongoing efforts to continue to manage and mitigate congestion. Some of the newer, more exciting ones include, you know, the Advanced Mobility Partnership, the, the work that group is doing to implement uh, the Mobility Choice Blueprint work. Um, really exciting stuff happening there, Micromobility Working Group, our continuing efforts at Dr. Cog for TDM, tra Transportation Demand Management, along with several corridor studies happening in the region. Um, yeah, lots of big ones happening right now. Um, you know, this is our this is our mantra. We uh, ways to mitigate congestion that's avoiding it, adapting to it, or alleviating it. Um, so going back here, I just want to spend another second here and just mention the kind of this, this, this change or this this the, the recent history, which has been a really exciting history in terms of VMT growth in this region. Before in this first period, there was really consistent growth pretty much since the invention of the automobile. We've talked about this in previous reports, but during the Great Recession. Uh, you know, there was a, a real flattening of VMT growth. It, it did not see much growth at all during that time, despite population increasing. You know, gas was really expensive during this time and other, other factors, obviously a bad economy contributed to that. And for a second, it seemed like we were on this, this economic recovery path and correspondingly VMT was almost like a market correction or something, if you will, that VMT was rapidly increasing, kind of getting back to that original trend from the first period. However, the last couple of years, we haven't seen that. And again, this is before COVID, but there's, is, you know, we, we don't know yet. That this may have been the beginning of a trend that is now, you know, now that we've had this COVID shock to the system that may have been even, you know, maybe more pronounced now. You know, lot, we're very curious about the future here and obviously the changes that are coming. So was there a new trend beginning before the effects of COVID-19? And, you know, I think we believe there was. And obviously we're very curious about the effects after effects of on travel after and, and during COVID-19. You know, will telework can continue? How will uh, transit recover after, after the pandemic is at an end? And then what does the future hold with all the technology happening connected to automated vehicles? There's a lot more change happening in transportation. That, and again, that with the shock to the system of COVID, um, a lot more unknowns, and some of that may be accelerating more than we had predicted in the past. So, because of that, there, we, we, you know, there is no observable increase in regional congestion, no in, in observable increase in VMT. Obviously, some specific locations, particularly where there may be construction happening or something like that, did, did experience increased um, congestion. So if you're looking for our data and maps, you can refer back to the 2018 table. This this 2019 document that should be or that is in your agenda is a little bit more brief than we typically do um, because of the the nature of no change and so much happening to our roadways right now with the pandemic. So let's talk about the pandemic for just a minute here and the effects we've seen so far um, in our region. Um, so this is we, the, our best source of information right now has been uh, the CDOTs. Uh, Traffic recorders, they, they record traffic 24-7, 365, right? So we're getting a constant stream of the, that data um, that we are able to update. We've got it through October right now, and we're very curious about what's coming next. But this is one of those stations at uh, 285 in Sheridan. We have about seven stations in our region. This one's pretty typical for the region, I would say. So this is looking at a comparison between 2019 and 2020. So you can see in April when the lockdowns really you know, we're at their peak, we 
that station was about down 45% compared to the previous year. Um, and then it's, you know, it's a pretty sharp recovery out of that. They, the MT really bounced back and by July, it had somewhat stabilized at about 15% less than um, 2019. And you can see by October, we're creeping up at about 10%. Now that, you know, notably October, there's still a lot of the telework activity happening. There is still, you know, the pandemic is worse than it was in April in terms of infection rates and deaths and all that. So there's a lot of travel happening out there. So 10% less, you know, kid, kids aren't in school. Um, so there's still a significant amount of travel happening out there, um, but the, maybe the types of trips and where those trips are going and the time of day those trips are happening is different. So we're very curious about all that. There's also regional differences. So we could look at another station on US 36 in McCaslin. And you know, that, that one decreased significantly more in April, down almost 60% compared to normal. And it's been a kind of slower to get back to um, what it would be normally. In fact, you know, significantly less still today than the other station, uh, 285 in Sheridan. We think that's primarily because that's more of a corridor that carries um, commuter, office commuters. So there's less, you know, travel from Denver to Boulder, Broomfield, uh, Louisville, Louisville. So, you know, the, that could be why that station um, is looking like that. Conversely, a station at 270 in New York in Commerce City, near a lot more freight and commercial activity, never never hit those lows in April, and in October was actually higher than the average in 2019. So this this kind of just shows you uh, the again one station started in Boulevard in 25. What happened? You can see that there is no average day in the Denver region. You know, there's snowstorms, there's holidays, there's various just effects. Uh, things change for special events that may affect a, a traffic situation, as you can see. Uh, and then, of course, our annual Halloween snowstorm, which is messes up traffic and trick or treating. Um, so, just one more, a couple more slides here. Uh, this is back in April, um, April comparing 2019 and 2020. And you can see that blue line. That's what you would expect, kind of as a normal daily pattern where you have your AM peak here and your PM peak here. Lots of that's rush hour, right? That's rush hour traffic. So in April of 2020, not only did we see that really big decrease, you know, 40, 50% decrease in total traffic, but the times of day in which people traveled changed significantly too. There's little bumps there, but you know, it, it kind of was more of a slow build up cumulative growth in traffic throughout the day. If we're looking at October, you know, the shape is kind of recovering. It's, you know, in fact, midday is basically the same as it was um, in 2019. Those peaks aren't quite getting as bad. And you know, that's a really significant um, cause of congestion. It's just that little extra percent. Once you hit that wall in congestion, once you hit the volume reaches the capacity of that roadway, that's when the speeds drop really significantly. So even those, you know, five, 10, 20% reductions in volume at those peak times really reduce um, you know, the burden on that roadway and the potential for changing the time of days in which people travel, you know, that, that we we're looking at right now with COVID, um, that may change the need for resources and in, in the future or the anticipated needs on the roadway system in the future in terms of roadway capacity. Oh, there's too many words in here. I'm not going to go through all of this, but, you know, th again, there's still, we're still, even with 10% less VMT on average throughout the, the region, there's still really high teleworking road, um, remaining significant reduction in transit ridership. And then, you know, other things we're interested in is which types of behaviors are gonna change in terms of people getting things delivered to their house. Obviously that was a huge emerging trend that was, that was occurring before, but now, you know, people I, th I think are getting a lot more things like groceries and meals delivered than they had previously. And how much of that will stick around? And as David mentioned earlier, crashes and fatalities very unfortunately back on the rise or e even above last year's rates, probably due to dangerous speeding levels. And I think that's what I have. Happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Spots. Uh, board members, if you have any questions or comments on this item, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six if you're on the phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you for questioning and comments. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question or comment is from Director Lynette Kelsey. Thank you. Um, Speaking from as somebody that's outside of that MPO area, this is really interesting. Um, I don't deal with the congestion in the metro area on a daily basis because I'm up here in Georgetown. But I wondered if 
similar congestion study was done for the, the non-MPO areas by CDOT and how does that information get shared with the jurisdictions? Do you know? I know CDOT has, you know, this is their data and I know they've been doing some of this, um, this work. There's kind of a limited amount of these their automatic traffic recording stations. I know there's one at the at the Eisenhower Tunnel. That'd be an interesting one to look at. Um, but you know they are limited. Even even in the Dr. Cog region, I think there's only seven stations we really dug into. There's there's a couple more, maybe 20 in the in the entire region. So CDOT has that data. You know it's something we could we could look at. Um, very curious about looking at that data. So but, but I know CDOT's done some as well. You could reach out to them. I can connect with the right person. Okay, thank you. Um, and one other question: Are are the con, is the main concern the congestion on Monday through Friday, or do we also get concerned about congestion on the weekends? Yeah, I seventy is obviously a very special case. There, we we usually typically hide, highlight that one um, in our congestion report because it's such a special case compared to the rest of the rest of the region. We care about all congestion. Um, weekdays during peak periods tend to be the most congested on most roadways in the Denver region, with the exception of I seventy E Seneca and a couple others. You know, specific roadways near special events um, that occur. You know, like the flea market, for example, is the eighty eight gets crazy busy, and that's why they're doing a study up there right now. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you for your comments, Director Kelsey. Uh, and with that, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to the chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Spots. Thank you for your presentation, and we, we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the next item, committee reports. And uh, with this, <clears throat> I'd like to sort of uh, go back to Executive Director Rex's uh, original comments. Uh, we are losing. Uh, a few members of our board. Uh, a couple of those members uh, are going to give committee reports tonight and please feel free to provide us some comments uh, if you desire. But uh, again, we, we truly appreciate your efforts on this on this board. And personally, uh, Director Jones and Director Partridge, I, um, I appreciate the ability to collaboratively work with you throughout the last number of years. Uh, with that, a uh, report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Jones. Thank you, Chair Dyack. Um, I don't actually have a stack report because stack didn't meet this month, but I will take um, the opportunity to say what a pleasure I think for both Roger and I it's been to serve as the Dr. Cog rep to the stack. And um, I guess it's been, I want to say, over five years. So. Um, uh, and just beyond that, just to be a part of the Dr. Cog team for my full eight years as a commissioner, um, I believe strongly uh, of Dr. Cog's importance as a, a voice for the region and have really, really appreciated the opportunity to collaborate with each of you personally on that vision and Dr. Cog collectively. And uh, one of the crowning achievements of my county commissioner career is um, chairing Dr. Cog, when we had a unanimous vote on the Metro Vision update, and that just means a lot to me that we were able to work together and across the entire region speak with one voice about our collective vision, and that included some last-minute um, negotiations with my partner Roger. Um, but we got there, and I feel really proud about that, and we'll really cherish the relationships I have with all of you and Dr. Cog staff and. Uh, I'll be around, so I'll, I'll I'll pop in for public comment periodically, just just to say hi and uh, see how we're doing. But thank you so much for it's really been an honor. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, report from Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, I've been informed Director Atchison has dropped off. Uh, my my go-to if Director Atchison is not here is Director Starker. Uh, Director Starker, uh, will you, would you be in a position to address this report? I'm happy to uh, step in in lieu of uh, Mayor Atchison. I probably won't do quite as adequate as he would, but the Metro uh, mayors met on December the 3rd. We had an extensive briefing from the uh, regional health departments of uh, Denver and, uh, and Jefferson County and the Tri-Counties and Broomfield and, uh, and Denver itself. The governor joined us with his team. So we talked about the, um, the challenges of the COVID 
problem at this time. And uh, we also spoke about the five star program. So uh, always a lot of uh, a lot of uh, good information going on there. And that will conclude my report. Thank you, Director Starker. A report from Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will certainly concur with uh, Director Jones. It's been a real privilege to serve on stack representing Dr. Cog and, and it's great to be able to serve with Elise and the staff and collaborate at the stack meetings is wonderful. And I really just want to thank everyone. It's been a great honor to serve with all of you and to see the collaboration and the discussion and the understanding and the input it certainly makes us all better and helps us better represent our own population. So I thank you everyone and I look forward to continued success for Dr. Kopp. The report on the, uh, the MAC, the Material Area County Commissioners, is we had a meeting, last meeting of the year, last Friday. Our topics were affordable housing and homelessness. And this pretty good, robust discussion, certainly using CARES funding and, and how that is being utilized, which is uh, you know pretty widespread how everyone has been using it for all good purposes to create those safety nets. And then also in the homelessness, we had varied um, approaches from as far as purchasing housing units for the homeless uh, and, and as much to then a lot of leaning on the faith-based community, which has been a wonderful approach. So uh, good report and certainly in this winter time, that was one reason we brought that to a discussion at this time of the year so we can help those in need. That concludes my report, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Director Partridge. Report from Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you so much. Uh, we talked about all things transportation uh, in the Aging Advisory Committee. Um, we uh, first got a report on uh, the eight providers that we fund and what they were able to accomplish before and during COVID um, and how we were able to shift our service model from paying for rides to paying for deliveries, which not only helped get services and, and needed goods groceries, uh, medications, supplies out to people, but it also helped um, our providers stay afloat during this really difficult time. Our second presentation was what, about Ride Alliance, which is a special project, a grant that we inherited from Dr. Mack um, called VTCLI, Veterans Transportation Community Living Initiative. We rebranded it to Ride Alliance because VTCLI is just too hard to say. Um, the goal is to improve access to transportation, reduce wait times, increase efficiency by creating a hub where rides needed would go into the hub and then participating providers could go in and, and pick up a ride. So let's, talk, let's think that a person needed to go to Anschutz um, from Lakewood. And so they got a ride and the the right the driver is at Anschutz. They look at into the hub, and the hub says, "Oh, there's someone right by Anschutz that needs a ride to Westminster." Um, that that transportation provider could pick it up. There's nothing I hate more than seeing empty buses that we fund. Hopefully, this we're we're testing a pilot of this hub right now. Um, and, and we're going to learn a lot from it. And hopefully in the years to come, we'll have a more efficient uh, transportation system that reduces uh, dead space in the vans and, and increases uh, uh, or decreases wait times for, provide, or for consumers. Then we talked about the future. How will, we, how will COVID impact the services? Will we still have the same providers when we come out of this? What will it look like? Will they have, you know, how long will it take to ramp up? Will we be ready for the demand? Will there be increased demand? And then looking forward, like from, that's like in the first two years and then going forward into five years and beyond, how are we gonna prepare for the aging of our population and the increased demand 
for transportation services that we know will come along with that. Um, the committee decided uh, that they wanted to create a subcommittee on transportation that would include um, some advisory committee members, but also some people from the uh, outside that are experts in this area to help us address all of these important issues. I also want to personally and on behalf of the AAA thank uh, Director Jones um, and, and Director Partridge for the work uh, and advocacy they've done for the Area Agency on Aging. Director Jones went to uh, Washington DC with us and advocated um, for the AAA and uh, Director Partridge has continued to be supportive and uh, helping us just be a better AAA and advocating for our programs and for the rural areas in our region. And I appreciate that, them so much, so thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. sanchez Warren. Uh, report from Regional Air Quality Council. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then I, at our Friday, December 4th meeting, um, we had a number of items. The first on the list here was uh, Clean Air Champions Award. And I must admit, I came in a little late and uh, I, I'm not sure exactly who got the awards, but I know at least one group got the award and that was uh, RTD was recognized for, for uh, being a clean air uh, champion. And Bill Van Meter, you might elaborate on that uh, when you get to your report, because I'm not quite sure exactly what you got it for, but when I came in, you were virtually standing up receiving the award. So uh, congratulations to RTD. Um, we approved the 2021 budget and work program. And um, uh, RAC staff provided us an update on the serious ozone plan. Uh, the state of implementation plan is uh, going to the Air Quality Control Commission. Uh, there's a two days of hearings that are coming up. Um, and um, uh, Amanda Brimmer on RAC staff provided us an update. Um, there's a, a party to the hearing, Wild Earth Guardians, they proposed that there was an alternative proposal that they, that they submitted um, that would reduce vehicle emission budgets by 25%. And you know, while us, Dr. Cog, were fully in support of uh, the need to lower emissions. We're, you know, we're not quite sure that that is the, the right avenue or venue to do that. Um, um, RAC has, in their pre-brief documents, pre-hearing documents, sorry, um, they they express their opposition to that. Um, and we will, um, myself as well as my counterpart, in North Front Range MPO, will serve as a rebuttal witness um, just to explain our process and some of the um, the, the potential. Um, grave effects that it could have on our planning process to the extent that we it could even affect our air quality conformity determination on our long range transportation planning. So um, I just wanted to I, I'm, I just want to provide you with that update. Um, and uh, let me see. I think that was it, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. Uh, the next report report from E470 Authority. It states Director Teal, Teal. Director Teal is in transition. He resigned his post from Castle Rock, I believe on December 1st, in preparation to become a commissioner uh, sometime here in January. So the chair will be taking over this report. Uh, the last meeting was December 10th. Um, the highlights are we recognized Roger Partridge for his service to the board. Uh, Roger has been a, a fantastic board member at E470 as well. And, we had significant accolades for him. Uh, and also we approved our 2021 budget. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the highlights there, I guess lowlights, uh, we expect our revenues and traffic to be down 10% next year uh, compared to this year, which was very challenging. Our year to date traffic um, uh, compared to the previous year, it, we're down 36% year to date. So here in 2020 versus 2019, we're down 36%. The last week of 12-12, we are down 44%. So um, that is a, a worsening trend, if you will. Um, it, is, it is the hope that we can, uh, we can get this COVID virus under control and return to some sense of normal. So people will go on our interstates and uh, attempt to use E470 as, as an, al an alternate route. So uh, with that, that is the end of my report. Um, the next report, report from CDOT, Director White. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be relatively brief tonight, but I, um, before I get into my report, I just wanted to offer to Director Kelsey to follow up on your questions about uh, statewide VMT trends. As uh, Robert mentioned, that is something we track. In fact, we've got about 117 recorders around the state. And coincidentally, we just had a similar briefing for our Transportation Commission today on this topic. So I'd be um, happy to follow up with you on that. Uh, but getting into some um, broader report on CDOT, uh, just a couple things I'll mention. You know, this is a, the time of year when we often look at what we've accomplished um, and been through over the, the year that just passed and, and also look forward to a new year ahead. So in keeping with that, we gave a, a, a report today to our commission on how we are doing and achieving our 10-year plan which is a document we worked very closely with CDOT or with uh, Dr. Cog on. Um, we're happy to say that, that even though we're just barely a year into having that plan um, sort of on the books, we've already seen some huge accomplishments. And I'll say that that Safer Main Streets program that the board approved tonight is chief among them. Uh, so seeing that program go forward, getting some major work done on, on I-70 and I-25, building some mobility hubs um, and improving rural pavement were all sort of um, accomplishments that we reflected on today with the commission as we look to hopefully receiving some additional funding in the year to come. Uh, the last thing I'll note is just to thank uh, Director Jones and Director Partridge again for your years of service on the stack. We'll very much uh, miss uh, having the opportunity to work with you on that body, but at the same time also welcome Director Stolzman and Director Maurer to the stack and I really look forward to working with you all in the years to come. And that's it for me tonight, thank you. Thank you, Director White. Uh, report on Fast Tracks, Director Van Meter. Thank you, Chair. Um, responding first to Executive Director Doug Rex's um, softball to me, RTD's um, award from the Regional Air Quality Council, the Clean Air Champion Award. Um, there's a long project description. I won't go through it all, but it's um, primarily recognizing RTD's con contributions to improving air quality by getting people out of single occupant vehicles as one of its core missions and purposes since our inception at RTD, and also in recognition of our fleet electrification actions to date, 36 battery electric buses on the free metro or mall ride, I should say, and um, our plans for future procurement and also uh, recognition that RTD is a member of the Colorado Electric Vehicle Coalition. So it, were, it was those actions for which we received the RACS Clean Air Champion. Now, two additional updates planned. Um, at their December Planning, Capital Programs, and Fast Tracks Committee in December, the RTD board heard updates regarding two topics of potential interest to Dr. Cog board. First is the process for the RTD board redistricting of director boundaries based on the decennial US Census. So redistricting efforts for RTD board director boundaries will commence next year, and the goal is to assure relatively similarly sized districts based on population. And our expectation is that boundaries will shift based on the relatively faster growth that we've seen in the eastern parts of the district. Board will be presented and plans to adopt their new district boundaries in late 21, early 22 timeframe. So that was one item. The, the final item is that the board also heard at that meeting a progress update on the Southwest Chief Front Range Passenger Rail Commission's work. The Joint Commission CDOT Front Range Passenger Rail Study and Amtrak's interest in potentially working toward a Front Range Passenger Service. Uh, the level of interest from uh, the RTD board was high. The board spent almost an hour on those topics. 
There is general interest expressed from many board members for RTD to continue to work collaboratively with CDOT, the Commission, and Amtrak, and a recognition from board members that partnerships could benefit all parties, including RTD's unfinished Northwest Rail and or North Metro Fast Tracks alignments. That concludes my update. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Uh, the next section of the agenda, informational items, please feel free to uh, review at your convenience. If you have any questions or comments on those, please uh, contact those who are listed as um, the, uh, the owners of, of those items. The next section of the agenda, administrative items, our next meeting is January 20th, 2021. Uh, next item, other matters by members. Um, if you have any other matters, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you if there are any other matters by our members. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just gonna see, take a quick look if there's any hands raised. And I do not see any at this time. All right, with no further business before uh, the Dr. Cog board, I will adjourn the meeting at 8.41. Happy holidays, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, John. Good night. Thanks. Happy holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy New Year. See you next year. <laughs> Happy holidays. Mm-hmm.